Sam, appreciate this opportunity to uh, join this conversation at NYU uh, from Bucolic, Ithaca, New York. Uh, happy to join that smaller institution uh, downstate uh, in New York City. Uh, this has been a great conversation that we've had today. Uh, appreciate all of the words that have been shared by the members of the industry. Uh, a lot of the things that we heard the industry members talk about um, spoke to the need for a to build a pipeline to prepare for the next generation of individuals who are going to be able to be a part of the commercial real estate industry. Um, and I've had a very uh, distinct pleasure of being a part of Cornell for six years and working in academia. But before my time here at Cornell, before I joined uh, this academic conversation, I was part of industry. And so what we're going to do it now is we're going to transition to, to a conversation amongst us faculty members who also straddle the world of both industry as well as the academic environment. And as we talk about building the pipeline, building uh, that, that flow of individuals who are going to be able to diversify the commercial real estate industry, that burden falls on us. Um, you all who've just been, been speaking, Jim and Tammy um, and One, um, talk about uh, you know, finding talent and promoting talent uh, and, and building in black communities. But you have, to, you have to have those folks coming through the pipeline. They have to be coming down the pipe for you to be able to hire. And so we in academia, those of us um, who, are, who have the fortune of being uh, faculty members and teaching, feel that responsibility as well. And so we uh, have been talking amongst ourselves about things that we could do um, to uh, build that pipeline and prepare the industry for the next generation of leaders who we want to see transform communities. Um, I'm joined by two other panelists. I'm going to turn the time over to them to, to introduce themselves, and then we're going to have kind of a round robin conversation and discussion about the topics we've been discussing this afternoon. Ger Gerard, if you'd like to go next. Uh, greetings, everybody. My name is Gerard Delane. I'm uh, also a professor at SHAC, um, NYU's Institute of Real Estate. Um, I've been teaching there for about five years now. Um, I also work in real estate development, and uh, I'm happy to say we actually have deals that are financed with Tammy's firm and with Margaret's firm, which is pretty awesome. We're one of those sponsors. Um, I also am a graduate of Florida A&M University, um, HBCU University, which we'll talk about a little bit in our discussion, um, and really excited about being a part of the solution and helping institutions create better opportunities um, for the African-American community. Okay, William, would you like to introduce yourself as well? I think you're on mute. I know you've got a lot to say. Can you guys hear me now? How you yes. doing? Thank you, Dustin. Uh, my name is William Parrish. I'm uh, an adjunct professor here at NYU uh, in the graduate program uh, in the construction management degree program. Uh, and I've been there for 14 years. Had an opportunity to see the university academia side uh, as it relates to diversity uh, in the uh, student body uh, in our own uh, faculty. Uh, but before that, and actually in addition to that, I've run my own firm as an entrepreneur, uh, construction management firm in New York and in New Jersey uh, for the last 15 years, uh, uh, actually in the community of Harlem on East 131st Street uh, and in Newark, New Jersey. So two urban centers concentrated on uh, construction management, mostly on the public side of the agency. But this is a great opportunity and conversation to be a part of uh, and, and to provide some real solutions for uh, these, these issues. I'm also a graduate of Hampton University, which is a historically black college and university. And uh, I finished my graduate degree work at uh, then Polytechnic University of New York, which is now uh, the engineering school for NYU. All right, Gerard, um, let's start with you. I want to talk, have you share us, share with us a little bit about your experience both in the industry and maybe some of the things that you experienced, uh, much like our, our panelists before us shared, and then talk about how you see it differently in academia. Is it different in academia? <clears throat> Are there opportunities for improvement um, and, and on both sides of the, of the fence? Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, professionally, uh, the number is very dismal in the executive level. You know, as most of us know, you know, less than 2% of real estate executives are African-American. Um, and for African-American women, it's an even smaller number. Uh, I'd say in the academia side, we're 
right around that number of a very, very small percentage in academia um, is of the African-American persuasion, um, both in the faculty, as Will mentioned, as well as in the student body. Um, and that we have to do a better job on improving the pipeline of young folks that come through the doors and that would go on to be the next Tammy, the next Craig Robinson at a wonderful institution. Bill, you've been at uh, Shaq for 14 years. You've seen a lot, obviously, and you can continue to run your own company. Share with us a little bit about your experience um, in industry as well as uh, in academia. Yeah, so um, as a certified minority-owned business, I've been on this side of the equation for an extended period of time. And uh, the issues are the same in business and also as we study real estate and academia. Uh, folks tend to say, you know, we'd love to add more diversity, but we just don't know where the people are. Uh, and to that, there is always an opportunity to create some new circles, align yourself with new partnerships to make certain that you can identify the folks, not just when it's time to act, but so that you can cultivate a relationship so that there is uh, a, a little more than just a resume or a little more than just a uh, box to check uh, when it's time to really expand um, the services or the skill sets in your operation. Um, but I'll tell you for the time that I've been on the graduate side, uh, and I use this sports analogy, I have a couple, I hope they're uh, not too much, but uh, you know, between the undergraduate and the graduate level, as far as I am aware, in terms of diversity for black and brown professors at, at Shaq, uh, we, we wouldn't be able to field a starting five, a basketball team, if, if you were uh, talking about that. So uh, I'm glad for this conversation. I'm glad that, uh, that we're starting it because we know we have work to do and we have some real time solutions on how we get it done. Thanks. Um, I wanted to share some experiences that I had um, in industry as well as in academia. As I mentioned, I, I, I practiced uh, or I worked in industry for about 15 years before I came to Cornell, practiced as a real estate attorney. And uh, in that time period, uh, some of the experiences I had, much like some of the, the, the discussions before us shared, where you have some of those, those microaggressions and things you just learn along uh, the way. I remember uh, being a young associate right out of law school and recognizing uh, that I would have to work very, very hard to make partner. And, and as a young associate in a law firm, that is the goal is to become partner. And so I was always just looking for uh, an opportunity to to be the best uh, at whatever I did. I just knew that's what I was going to have to do. And so I remember being the, the attorney, the associate that built the highest um, hours that year. I worked the hardest. I slept on the floor every night. I, I, I came in early, went home late, didn't ever let uh, any of the partners uh, go, um, not see me in my office and at my desk at most of the time. And so knew that was something I would need to do. And the same thing when it was, uh, time for me to become uh, voted as a partner of the firm, make sure that I had all of the uh, boxes checked and it had the highest revenue of any of the other associates that were going to be up. And even still in that environment, you still sense that like, am I going to be treated fairly? Am I going to have an opportunity uh, to have a seat at the table? And as, I, as I've transitioned over into academia, um, I, I made the, after I'd made partner of the firm, uh, fortunately, um, I made the decision to start stepping into academia because I felt it was an opportunity for me to actually do something tangible because I did recognize when I was at the firm that I was one of a handful of, of, of men of color, particularly black men, particularly in Arizona where I'm, where I'm from. Um, I was at the largest law firm in the state, uh, one of the oldest law firms in the state. And in the 70 some odd year history of the firm, and there were hundreds of attorneys, uh, I was the second black man to make partner in over 70 years of the firm. Um, it was astounding to me. I was like, really? Um, and, but that was the reality. And so I really tried to, to, to effectuate change within the firm and, do, and, and create diversity initiatives to, to reach out into the community and build that pipeline of, of, of diverse candidates coming into uh, the firm. And as I transitioned to academia, I felt like I, I could have a greater influence in doing that because I felt that, that was the, that's the crossroads, um, education, is the thing that's needed in order to be able to move into these other um, echelons, upper echelons, and be able to effectuate change. So some, what are some of the things um, that, that, Bill, you've seen in your 14 years at NYU that the university has been doing as, and, and, and other anchor institutions to effectuate change and really to, to uh, create a more diverse uh, representation within, within commercial real estate? You're on mute. 
First thing I'll say is maybe it's a little late, but I'm glad for the uh, HBCU partnership that NYU has just created. Uh, that is definitely a step in the right direction. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, more and more people. Can you, speak, I guess, can you speak in more detail about that, sure, for those that don't know? Well, uh, so so Shaq just uh, created an opportunity for students who have studied undergraduate work at a historically black college and university to come in with a focus on real estate at Shaq. Uh, and they've also uh, started a, a, a opportunity for uh, students who have studied at uh, Hispanic uh, institutions, uh, Hispanic aligned institutions to make certain that there is uh, some representation there. And I think it's going in the right direction. Uh, I just uh, saw an article from ASCAP the Association of Music Publishing, who, who also just created a, a major internship uh, for historically black college and university students. And the key is just aligning yourselves in new circles, uh, rather than waiting for the opportunity to come up and say, well, you know, we'd love to do it. We'd love to add more. We just don't know where these people are. Creating these types of circles and these types of artificial connections make it so that when these issues come up, you can better address them. And, and why? The, the, the big issue is why do we need this whole conversation on diversity? Uh, as a, a lead accredited professional, I attend the Greenville Conference every year. And uh, in November, I had a chance to go to Atlanta and hear uh, President Barack Obama speak. And he spoke about diversity in detail. And one of the things he said was uh, diversity is not meant to be onerous or, or a penalty, but it is the natural way that we accommodate for blind spots that we have. And, you know, like a blind spot, you don't even know it's there. If you don't know what to look for, if you don't know how it's affecting you, if you are just going on with business as usual, the way you always normally do, then you might not know that there is a need to correct a blind spot. But correcting the blind spots actually uh, not just add diversity, but create understanding, create a better product, create a better bottom line, and uh, all in the name of opportunity and advancement. So it's really, really critical that these institutions do this as well. So whether it is, uh, you know, pro partnering with Reese, partnering with uh, organizations like the Urban League, uh, historically well, black you, colleges. You bring up a, a number of institutions. Uh, NYU mm -hmm. is in New York City. Uh, and uh, New York City is a very diverse city. Mm -hmm. um, are there institutions within New York City that NYU is partnering with, has partnered with, or should be partnering with to, to realize these goals? Let me take, let me start with should. Uh, when I look at the makeup of the student body, especially on the graduate side, I probably see 70% international students. And uh, I always like to say you exist within the context of your environment. Here is an opportunity where now that has to change. Uh, if 70% of your student body is international, well, in the COVID-19 protocol, uh, you have some folks who can't get visas, you have some folks who can't travel, you have some folks who won't be back at the school. So if there was never an opportunity to take advantage of uh, this recruitment effort that's necessary, then it should be done here locally and at home. Uh, I think if you looked at the uh, makeup of the schools in New York City uh, and started to reach out to uh, the guidance counselors, uh, the high school uh, student body, uh, maybe a high school fair or, or anything like that that allows you to expose the university to these folks to see that there is an opportunity that they can go here. Number one, opportunity that they, they could attend and that there is representation that looks like them and that there is a place at the table for them. You know, uh, you can talk about the cost to go to NYU and it's very expensive, but at the same time, you can create paths and opportunities like other schools have done to uh, increase the seats at the table. Absolutely, it can be done. And now's the time. Gerard, any, any thoughts on the same topic in terms of things you've seen and things uh, uh, that we should be doing? Things that we should be doing. Um, I think, you know, NYU has education on the undergrad and graduate level. So on the graduate level, you know, I believe we should be reaching out to more historically black colleges and universities and letting them know we exist, right? We're a master's in real estate and here's the outcome of graduating from this wonderful institution. You know, myself as an alumni, I know how wonderful the alumni network is on the other side of that degree. Um, and the, you know, employment opportunities, the entrepreneurial opportunities as a result of going through that experience. On the undergrad side, I think we should do a much better job on reaching high schools in New York City, right? We're the biggest city in America. 
um, and we get very, very, very few students from the city of New York, and in particular, minority students from New York City. I think we can do a much better job on getting folks out of there, lifting them into this wonderful industry that can mold their communities as you know we know that they can do. At, at Cornell, a couple of the things that I've done since I've been here that, again, to try to do something meaningful and, and really contribute to the conversation, and even if it's incremental stuff. So um, um, many of us, you know, you can have big, grandiose visions, large visions of doing, um, doing things, and sometimes it can be overwhelming. Um, but I think that there is, there is definitely a place for making incremental change, just taking a step. Um, when we, I mean, all of us have reflected on, on, on the, what we're going through right now in this crisis uh, and the emotions of seeing, you know, death right. of a black man uh, and all that. You, you just get overwhelmed emotionally by it and you're like, well, what can I do? I think that some of the folks in the previous uh, panel said the same thing. And at my institution, some of the things that I decided uh, we would do with, um, and really support when I became the director of the program was to really to put our money where our mouth is and, and start to, to take action. And so part of it was just focusing on the students. And so um, I knew that the students got it, the students um, understood it, that next generation, the young generation. Um, and we started a couple years ago, uh, the Philip Payton Society, um, that is the Black or minority um, student associate, real estate association, and 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 um, Philip Payton being the the first you know, African American and the father of 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 Harlem, and so we, we did that um, to give minority students a place and to have conversations about and invite uh, Black um, real estate developers and investors to campus to influence that next generation, and then also to be able to go into those communities and 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 do change. Um, we also you know, created a club for the, the women uh, organization. Again, the, our real estate program, graduate program being you know, 20 years old, but there was never a, a real estate uh, program for the women within the group. And there've been lots of conversations about, you know, we, we, have, we already have a, a club for students, but we as an institution don't have, you know, these other smaller breakout groups. But I felt like the, those uh, other groups needed to have their, their space as well. And so we did that. That was one of the things that we, as an institution to foster in, in that culture of diversity, both women and minority within real, real estate. And, and I think it's been successful, but it was just those smaller incremental steps. Um, both of the presence of these organizations have been um, young adults of color, a black, a, a black man and a, and a black woman uh, as presidents of these clubs over the past couple of years, um, which we take great pride in because they, are, they have an eye towards what we can do. And um, um, I think, it, Gerard, if you'd like to share some of the things, I know we, we've talked about this, some of the things that you, you have done. So we talked about what you should, but talk about some of the things you have done. And then also if we could transition to um, some of the other anchor institutions we've talked about, um, different associations and other schools we can partner with. But what about the corporations? What can universities do to partner with corporations? So I'll give you a great example of what I have done. Um, so I'm luckily enough to have worked with Sam and Tammy on a high school program uh, where we've brought in students from all over the country, um, young African-American high schoolers, uh, to teach them about business and real estate. And it was a great two-week session where they you know, were able to come, learn about the city, and learn about business and get that first college experience. Uh, which will hopefully give them a springboard to say, hey, I want to go to college too. Even if I don't go to NYU, I'll go to, you know, somewhere that's comfortable for them. Um, you know, we have to create the pipeline for them. And that's one tangible, you know, event that we participated in. We had a couple of corporate sponsors that helped pay for it. So, yes, you know, you ask, you know, how can institutions get involved? Help fund that, right? Help so, give. I think there's also a recognition, draw that it's not something that universities can do alone. It's not something that industry can do alone. Um, but the partnership in exactly. building those pipelines, those relationships is, is really what, it, what it's about. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So we can create the scenario. We need the support of the industry. As a matter of fact, as a part of that you know, two-week event, we had guest speakers come in every single day. So every day they saw you know, a Black lawyer, right? a Black investment banker, a Black developer, I brought in a young black venture capitalist, right? Many of them have never met a black venture capitalist before, <laughs> right? And I brought these young men and said, hey, here's what I do for a living, right? I love it. I enjoy it. Here's what I like about it. And by the way, I make money doing it, right? And that's a tangible thing that can create direct change to individuals. So I think that's a great example where, you know, it's not this big impossible thing. 
right? Come and guest speak once to a high school with kids where you can be that trigger in their brain. Like, oh, I'd be interested in doing that. I've never thought about that. I never knew that even existed. I can see myself in this person that's speaking and becoming that change agent. But, you know, if I can just interject uh, on what Gerard just said, it's a great point. I don't think these efforts should be uh, uh, localized to just uh, Martin Luther King Day or, or February Black History, right? Uh, Hampton University runs a very successful leadership uh, aptitude program where every Tuesday they have speakers from industry, speakers from Wall Street, speakers from Fortune 500 companies coming in to speak and address students at the School of Business. It, it doesn't have to be any different here. Uh, maybe it's not every Tuesday, but maybe it's once a month. Uh, similar to the same way you do a capital markets forum, uh, uh, but you know maybe it's quarterly or or once a month, but a regularly scheduled invitation that allows this this discourse and and this uh, uh, a scenario to take place, so that it's not just localized to an event or you muted, you timed out. No, I think you muted yourself. We, we talk about how these things get baked into the system. And I think just an opportunity to create some networks that uh, run year round and not just localized to a sp specific event or, or time of the year uh, will help us a lot. The program you talked about, Gerard, um, with bringing the high school students, uh, Cornell has done that as well. We did it last year where we had uh, a handful or actually two dozen students come to campus, live in the dorms over the summer. Uh, we partnered with Reese and, and, and that organization to do that. But that was something that I recognized from the time I got to Cornell. If we wanted to start building this pipeline and, and, and preparing the next generation. It wasn't something that the university could do alone, that we needed industry. Um, and so the industry needed to be a part of it and we need corporate sponsors and, and, and someone that was involved in, in recruiting and finding these kids. And so there are organizations out there that do this work um, it's a matter, I think, of trying to connect the dots. And I think that's, as we look at solutions, um, thinking out of the box, not being overwhelmed with thinking you have to do it all alone and solve the problems. Um, but that there are many organizations out there that, that are also looking for opportunities um, and identify those opportunities for partnership. I think that's one of, one of the critical things that we can do. Um, before we wrap up here and, 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 and pass it back to Sam to conclude, I uh, just wanted to, in your classes, and since we're all, we're all, we all teach as well, are there things that you're doing or, um, to help your students uh, recognize? Um, I, I, I just want to make note because I, I, I'm, my background is as a zoning and land use attorney, and um, I have, even though I'm teaching business students, teaching them about entitlements and zoning and real estate, um, and, and obviously preparing them to be developers or investors in real estate, want them to understand the context of what they're doing and the history of, of, of zoning and entitlements law. Um, so I, I've always, over the past couple of years, tried to incorporate um, academic conversation discussions about gentrification, about the history of zoning law and the history of how it was used to exclude people um, from communities and zone them out of communities um, so that they understand why there is this tension these days when you go into a community, you try to build something and you're just investing. I can't tell you how many clients I had that would just bought land and try to invest and didn't realize that the neighborhood and community were going to come out in force and opposition. And I was hired to then kind of clean up and work with uh, elected officials to solve those problems. Um, but understanding the context of what you do and the history of it. Another book that I've re read recently and I've been including in my um, uh, in my, in, will be including in my conversations because it just came out in, in March was a uh, race for profit and also getting the history of how uh, black blacks were kept out of the, the wealth creation system of owning real estate uh, systematically for decades, um, which uh, Tammy spoke to in terms of it building wealth and that generational wealth that blacks have just not been a part of and haven't been able to pass that down. Um, some thoughts you might have on that? Yeah, um, I certainly in my class uh, teach uh, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, uh, and also uh, I like to include minority business. Uh, Shack Institute is 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 a a program that is uh, very focused on private development, asset management, et cetera, et cetera. So I enjoy bringing the public construction uh, lessons, if you will, into the class. You know, where there is a, a requirement to use minority and women-owned business, historically underrepresented people as well. So that is a running theme uh, and, it, and it stays concurrent. But I would just say that, you know, I'm also uh, teaching the class from the level where you are a senior vice president or executive director of an organization. And one of the things that we focus on is legislation as it relates 
to how we do our job. Uh, I always say you exist within the context of your environment. So uh, you can't go out and, and build your project with civil unrest as we've had like you know, what day 26, day 27 of civil unrest. Uh, you can't just go out and build your project in a COVID environment, right? So you have to think about these things, but the people, the community uh, become the focus. You know, in, in terms of sustainability, you know, there's one point where we were talking about trying to make buildings more efficient and the whole conversation changed now to the people, you know, social justice. You shouldn't have bad water just because you live in an underrepresented area. You shouldn't have uh, bad air because you live in a historically underrepresented area. So trying to change the discussion and make that part of the fabric so that people understand that uh, these things can be tackled as long as you're paying attention to them as you're moving forward. Great. Thank you. Gerard? You know, I teach a course called uh, Public Private Real Estate Projects. And, uh, you know, I, I invited some of my students to, to listen into this conversation today. Um, and one of the things I teach in my class is like, yes, you're supposed to make money, right? You have to make money. Your business has to thrive. That's great. But what else are you giving that community, right? And being sensitive to that, that you're not just coming in, building a big shiny building, making money and going home, that you're actually affecting people's lives, people's livelihood, people's home, um, you know, and being thoughtful about that impact that you're going to have on the community. So I try to make that a part of all my classes, but that class in particular, I try to ingrain in them, here's the things to look for, here's the things to think about, and especially cities like New York City, you know, most of our urban cities, you know, West Coast included, you know, many of them have a very high minority population. Um, you're building all these apartment buildings. Um, you have to be thoughtful about not just, you know, the community you come from, but communities that you don't come from and learning, you know, what are those cultures like? What are they looking for? What are their housing needs? How are you addressing that in this new home that you're building for profit? Thank you both uh, for this time that we've given today or we've been uh, able to share with this group. Um, Sam, I want to turn the time back over to you. And again, thank you for bringing the faculty together. Um, we could talk for hours and hours and hours. We don't want to do that today, um, but want to appreciate and thank you for the opportunity you've given us. Well, th thank you, uh, you know, uh, Bill, Gerard, Dustin. I, I so appreciate this. I have to say it's, it's never easy for a large institution to turn a critical eye on itself um, and invite the public to participate. Uh, but uh, the points that Bill made uh, are, are really important. Um, I think when we think about our goals and aspirations for inclusivity um, and diversity uh, in our programs at SHAC and other academic institutions all around the country, uh, it's very clear that while we've made some real progress and done some really exciting things, um, that we have so much more to do um, and that uh, we need more than incremental improvement in, in the outcomes. Um, uh, if uh, you know of a young person who is thinking about studying real estate, uh, we've invested over the last couple of years in dramatically expanding our uh, pool of resources for uh, minority uh, recruitment and um, are still working hard on making sure that folks find out about those programs. Uh, just